I may be a Florida boy born and raised, but when it comes to summer vacations, the best places to go must have mountains. I took my first ever totally solo vacation at the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, located in the states of Tennessee and North Carolina. My first stop was to Cataloochee, a rather secluded area in the northeast portion of the park. If you're willing to make the hour-long drive off the main road over a mountain on the nation's most butt-puckering dirt road, then you're going to love visiting the Cataloochee Valley. I've been to the National Park several times, but I've never had the chance to come here before, and it was a great way to begin the trip. Though I have to say, this unpaved road, 3,000 feet above level ground, has to be second only to that ridiculous death road they have down in Bolivia. Those closest to me will tell you that I'm a sucker for historic buildings, especially churches. Click the link below for another video on that topic. When I was a kid coming to this park with my family, I bought a little booklet about the Churches of the Smokies, and ever since then I've always wanted to come back and visit them. And this was my chance. I actually made it to six of the seven historic churches found within the park. The first one on the list was the Palmer Chapel Methodist Church, which you just saw, built in the 1920s. As with all the church buildings in the park, it isn't used for regular services anymore, but yearly reunions and homecomings still take place at them. Palmer Chapel is nestled quaintly next to a little creek which runs through the Cataloochee Valley. I also enjoy visiting old school buildings. There's another video link below on that subject. And near Palmer Chapel Church is the old Beech Grove Schoolhouse built in 1903. It's a simple little frame building with two classrooms to house the pupils of the Cataloochee Valley. The kids would keep their lunch pails in the creek to keep them refrigerated, and sometimes they'd have to run out and grab them if it started to rain so that the excess water wouldn't wash their lunches away. The views around Cataloochee Valley are positively idyllic. Everywhere you turn, there's a strikingly picturesque scene waiting to be enjoyed. Matter of fact, I'm prepared to argue that this is probably the most beautiful portion of the entire park. But ultimately, that's just my opinion. I'm also a sucker for old cemeteries, morbidly enough, so when I saw a sign pointing in the direction of one, I immediately cut across the field to take a look. It ended up being at the apex of a fairly steep trail, and needless to say, I was quite out of breath when I got there, but one has to admit that it's a pretty spot to be laid to rest. Plus, I reckon you'll be that much closer to God when old Gabriel blows the trumpet. Back down I went, and behold, the butt end of a she-elk. It was getting pretty late in the day and the sun was quickly retreating behind the mountains, so I had to make the trek back out of the valley. I only wish I had planned more time there. Take my advice and save this part for last instead of first. That way, when you're tired of all the crowds of people, more on that later on, you'll have the run of this secluded part of the valley and there won't be near the amount of people to dodge. The next morning, my first stop was to Smokemont Baptist Church, also known as Lufty Baptist Church, just a couple miles north of the O'Connor Lufty Visitor Center outside of Cherokee. The building is perched high over the road, but it's only a short walk to get up there. It was first thing in the morning and there was no one here, so I was able to take my time and enjoy the craftsmanship as well as contemplate the spiritual history of the place. After going in the front door, I was surprised to find the general layout of the church different than I expected, with the pulpit being situated on the right side halfway down, as opposed to being front and center as you typically see. I stepped out the back door to take a look around and found an old outhouse about 30 yards away. Now it was a two-holer. 
and after a brief and uncomfortable moment imagining what it must have been like to share this outhouse with another person at the same time, I headed back down the hill to explore more of the park. I saw an old galvanized pipe next to a little downhill stream in front of the church, and I wondered if maybe this was the church water fountain. And then I wondered if this site would have been the place where Sunday school might have been held. On my way up to the center of the park, I beheld several breathtaking views, and thankfully the morning was clear and bright and allowed me to look over many miles of God's magnificent creation. I found myself stopping at nearly every pullout to take it all in. After starting and stopping for miles, I finally made it to the center of the park at Newfound Gap, and then I followed the state line westward to Klingman's Dome, the highest peak in the Smokies, at 6,643 feet, capped with a concrete observation tower that offers up 360-degree vistas and allows one to see for dozens of miles on a clear day. You can even see the towns of Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge just outside the park. It's a grand thing to see such old and dignified mountains as these from this perspective. Now, keep in mind, the walk up to the tower is a steep half mile, but worth every hard-won breath. And take my advice, don't go down the same way you went up. There's a short, mile-long trail through the woods that meanders its way back down to the parking lot from the observation tower, and some of the most gorgeous mountaintop scenes in the whole park are found here. Now, being from Florida, I'm not used to doing a great deal of mountain hiking. I can only imagine how much better my physique would be if we had mountains in the panhandle. Fortunately, no one was close by to see me almost bust my tail. Twice. Florida folks do enjoy the beach. I don't. But I bet more of us love coming up to these mountains more than we love going to the beach. Because the highest hill we've got in Florida is 345 feet above sea level. And right now I'm over 6,000 feet above sea level and loving every minute of it. By the way, that hill that's 345 feet, I did a video on it. Click it right here. Do it now. Actually finish watching this one first, then go back and do that one. After reaching the end of the trail, I drove back over to Newfound Gap and stopped to eat a little lunch. I found a nice shady spot at the top of the Rockefeller Monument to sit and rest while I ate, and did a little people watching as well. Here, as at Klingman's Dome, there are wonderful sights to survey and some more trails to hike. And on the way back down, I seen myself a bear. My next stop was the Mingus Mill, which was built in the 1890s and is still up and running today. Cornmeal produced here can be purchased in the visitor centers in the park. The mill, of course, runs on water power, with water being diverted from the creek up the hill down to the mill itself. The gentleman working inside the mill today is actually a grandson of the original builder of the mill. 
After finding that out, I had to go down underneath and take a look at the machinery. The following morning, I got up early and I was determined to make my way out to Cadiz Cove, two hours away from where I was staying, and try to beat the crowds. But naturally, I couldn't help but be distracted into stopping every few hundred yards from the time I entered the park. As soon as I crossed the park boundary, I saw a bull elk out in the morning fog and snapped a couple quick shots as I drove by. I ended up seeing a pile of elk along the road, some out in the open and others hiding in the tall grass. Eventually, I did make my way out to Cades Cove, but unfortunately, I didn't beat the crowds. The cove itself is full of natural beauty and history, but I found myself getting increasingly aggravated at the crowds of people the entire time I was there. The 11-mile loop road is a one-way drive, and at times it can take up to three hours to make the loop because of the bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. But I was determined to see as much as I could. My first stop was the John Oliver Cabin, built in the 1820s. The next three stops were, of course, churches. First, the Cades Cove Primitive Baptist Church, where, oddly enough, there was a guy with a long white beard sitting up by the pulpit playing the harp, which is funny to me because Primitive Baptists practice non-instrumental singing. Out back in the cemetery, I saw the grave of a Revolutionary War veteran. Further down the road was the old Methodist church building, similar in size to the Primitive Baptist Church. I stopped at the Missionary Baptist Church building. This congregation actually split from the Primitive Baptist congregation back in the 1800s because some in the church believed in conducting missionary work where the Primitive Baptists did not. Further around the Loop Road, I stopped at the Cades Cove Visitor Center and walked around the old cable home and farm and also the old cable mill, which is also still operational. It was here that the crowds of people really began to get under my skin. I mean, I generally enjoy being around people, don't get me wrong, but I didn't come to a national park to rub elbows with folks. I actually ended up skipping quite a few sites just to be able to get out of Cades Cove quicker. But I couldn't help but stop at this little cabin nestled neatly in a clearing. And the best part was that no one else was here. That is, until a couple of Yankee women walked up and talked non-stop about how they would remodel the place if they owned it. SMH people. Anyway, it was still worth the stop. My suggestion is to get to Cades Cove at the first hint of sunlight in the morning if you're going to beat the traffic and enjoy it. My next stop was one where I could kill two birds with one stone. The Little Greenbrier School Building is little more than a crude log cabin, set at the end of a winding trail less than a mile off the main road. Some students walked as far as nine miles every day to get here for class. A Primitive Baptist congregation also met here for many years, as evidenced by the cemetery found in front of the building. Having reached the end of my time in the Smokies, I decided to go out of my way to make one more stop, this time at the Fontana Dam, which is located on the National Park's southern boundary. The hydroelectric dam was built on the Little Tennessee River in the early 1940s to provide electricity to the area and has been operated by the Tennessee Valley Authority ever since. It's the tallest dam east of the Mississippi River, second in the country only to the Hoover Dam out west. The views from the dam looking over the resulting lake are spectacular. Now, of course, I thought up a lot of really hilarious dam jokes, but I decided I better not put those in the video.
There's a small visitor center and gift shop located on the east side of the dam, but as of July 2020, it's closed for the season. There are also bathrooms with showers available for hikers coming through on the Appalachian Trail. The scenery out here is awesome. I really wish I had a kayak with me on this trip to be able to get out on the lake and enjoy these calm waters. So ends my trip to the Great Smoky Mountains, and now I'm headed back to the good old Florida Panhandle. As the old timers would say, you can't beat this with a stick.